The central Indian tiger landscape covers 35% of the forest area of the states of Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh and parts of Andhra Pradesh and supports major tiger source populations. This landscape has a network of tiger reserves interspersed with forest patches and corridors. Following the public outcry that started in 2004 when India realised it was losing its tigers to poachers at an alarming rate, the government responded by establishing the National Tiger Conservation Authority. Poachers were arrested, new protected areas were declared, and most importantly, people and domestic animals were prohibited from most core zones, resulting in more space and food for wild animals. These efforts brought tiger numbers to more than double, from 1,411 animals that were counted in the tiger census of 2006, to 2,967 in the last census in 2018. The great debate between conservationists who believe that tourists cause stress among tigers and want to ban tourism, and the government that believes that tigers in their habitat should benefit local communities and businesses financially, was handed over to the states. Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra opted for tiger tourism. Prior to India's economic boom in the 1990s, many of India's protected areas were open to the public. To obtain permission was not easy, but those who managed could travel with their own vehicle and could stay in forest rest houses inside the parks. The states realised that to cope with the high demand and to protect tigers, things would have to change. Private vehicles are now prohibited, and safari is only possible with vehicles that are registered with the forest department. Mostly this is by 4x4 Suzuki Jeeps, known in India as Gypsies or in an open-roofed minibus. Numbers of vehicles are regulated according to zones. Only six people are allowed in a jeep, and it is prohibited to get out of the vehicle at any time. Safari time is usually from 6 to 10 in the morning and 4 to 6 in the evening. In between, all vehicles have to exit. Any people you may see within the parks are employed by the forest department. Some parks offer a breakfast break in a local village, a welcome move to boost the local economy. Accommodation is prohibited inside the park and is only allowed in specially designated areas in places that were rural villages before and have now mushroomed into small towns catering for tourism. Most parks in central India are closed for three months during monsoon time from July to October but some still operate in their buffer zones. The most popular tiger reserves are Rantambore in Rajasthan, Bandavgarh and Kanha in Madhya Pradesh, and Tadoba in Maharashtra. It is important to book your safari via the internet. First, you have to decide which park you want to visit and search on Google. Scroll down to the correct website, which is the official website of the state, and should end with .gov.in. It is important to book well in advance, especially if you want to visit the best zones where tiger sightings are more frequent. Keep in mind that rules change, and there are different rules in different states. If you come without a reservation, you may only be able to get a place in a minibus, Check the rules carefully if you are a foreign national or if there are foreigners in your group. You may have to pay significantly more. Foreigners who are resident of India pay the Indian price. After booking your safaris, take care of your accommodation. Make sure it is near enough to your entry gate. The Tiger Reserves of India are located in remote places and will take a long time to reach, whether by car, plane or train. The last part of the way, you will have to travel by car. Once reached, check into your hotel or lodge and be sure to locate your driver and arrange to be picked up. 
for your first safari. The driver will pick you up before dawn and take you to your gate. Vehicles which arrive first stand more chances to spot animals in the early hours. Your permit will be checked and compared with the ID of all members of your group. These steps are taken to avoid a black market and only registered people will be admitted. This procedure takes time and vehicles at the end of the queue will enter the park later. It is very cold on winter mornings, so try to dress accordingly. A mandatory guide will be provided. Pass the gate and you're in the core zone of a national park. First, you'll be driving in a convoy of jeeps. Fortunately, early morning dew keeps the ground wet and avoids dust. Later, the jeeps spread out on different routes. Some stop to look at common wildlife like peacocks and langurs. Others stop by water bodies and wait for action. All parks have a network of water holes and salt licks, and some have large lakes that were created by large dams downstream. Soon you will find your jeep relatively alone. If you are lucky and you have a good driver and guide, this is the time when they will get into action, checking the ground for tiger footprints and listening for alarm calls. Most of the drivers and guides are locals. Some of them were poachers before, and now they make a living by showing people the animals that they once hunted. Their benefit directly affects wildlife, and if you feel they're doing a good job, please tip them generously. Soon you will come across small groups of spotted deer, the most common type of deer and the main prey for tigers. Spotted deer, or chito, as they are called in India, are usually to be found foraging together with common langurs. Langurs benefit the cheetah by providing alarm calls when they see predators from trees. Other types of deer are the small barking deer or muntjac and sambar, the largest deer in the world. These two types of deer are usually seen solitarily or a female with young. Wild boars and jackals will be seen in more open places. These open areas that sometimes have evidence of human activities are places where villages were previously and have now been relocated outside the park. What is remaining of their former rice fields is now good grassland that attracts large numbers of herbivores, which in time attracts predators. Back in the forest, you may see small herds of Indian bison or gore. This large animal is the ancestral father of all modern cattle. They suffered a huge population decline in the 1960s due to epidemics, but now their numbers are rising again. You may be lucky and spot a tiger on your first outing. But usually you'll need to take a few safaris if you want to see tigers and other rarer and more difficult wildlife. For a better chance of success, you should try and visit for a minimum of three days and try and book as many safaris as possible. With time, you may encounter some of the other predators of the central Indian jungles. Sloth bear is endemic to the Indian subcontinent. It feeds mainly on insects like termites, Dole, or Asian wild dog, is a diurnal pack hunter, which preferentially targets medium and large-sized ungulates. The very lucky will see a leopard, the most elusive and difficult animal to spot. As they are usually nocturnal, it is more likely to spot them resting on trees. Tiger reserves are all about tigers, and if you do not see one, you will feel very disappointed. Driving around for hours in an open jeep on cold mornings is not very pleasant. Fortunately, the strict measures the government took to protect tigers are paying off. Numbers of tigers have increased, and so has the number of sightings. You may locate a tiger by yourself or with the help of your guide, but most likely while driving you will see a group of vehicles gathering together. 
This is usually the best indication that something interesting is happening. In other cases, your driver will receive a phone call and immediately will speed to the site. Many times the tiger is sleeping and only small parts of him are seen. At other times, the tiger is active and on the move. When this happens, the drivers will chase the tiger, and when it disappears, they will move on to the next place where he may show up. By then, expect nearly all the vehicles in your zone to gather. Selfie with a tiger is what motivates most tourists who come to tiger reserves. These tigers meet tourists in their jeeps nearly every day and are very used to being around them. In Ranthambore National Park in Rajasthan, tigers have been observed using vehicles as a cover to strike prey. Many times, tigers sit by the side of the road, ignoring the crowd around them. The noise of the vehicles and the people in them seems to have very little effect on tigers. If they felt disturbed, they would vanish into the forest in seconds. Some parks in Madhya Pradesh offer elephant safaris. Now it is possible only to go for a short ride on an elephant. But previously they had a system that nearly guaranteed sightings. Watching a tigress playing with her cubs from the back of an elephant was the best wildlife experience I've ever had. However, tiger shows are now banned, but may be permitted in the future. Birdwatching is difficult while on safari. You cannot get out of your vehicle, and the vehicle cannot go off the road to follow birds. Using binoculars in a moving jeep is useless. If you tell your guide you're interested in birds, he will probably show you some common species and roosting sites of owl, mostly jungle owlet and Indian Scots owl. You will probably be able to see larger birds like storks at waterholes or raptors sitting on trees or flying. Mostly these will be crested hawk eagles and crested serpent eagles, the more common raptors of the Indian forests. Kanna and Bandavgarh National Parks hold a good population of Indian and red-headed vultures. These vultures are now classified as critically endangered following large population declines which came after the vultures were exposed to a drug called diclofenac sodium, which was used to treat domestic animals and caused kidney failure in vultures that ate the carcasses, leading to their deaths. On foot, it is only possible to bird in agricultural areas around villages and along the forest edge. Very few people attempt to bird in these areas, as tiger safari is their main aim. However, some endemic and near-endemic Indian birds can be seen here more easily than in other places. It is here where you can find in winter grey-headed and red-headed bunting. Crested bunting, Indian bushlark and ashy-crowned sparrowlark are residents. Rocky areas on the forest edge are a good place to search for painted spurfowl. More forested areas will have white-browed fantail and yellow-crowned woodpecker. At night, there is a good chance for night jars. You will probably find some if you walk at night with a torch around the compound boundary of your lodge. The rainy season is good for birds like rain quail and painted francolin. These are common birds that are almost never seen out of the monsoon season and are more often heard than seen. The more upmarket lodges usually have gardens and offer suitable habitat for birds. Some do more and try to restore habitat on their land in the hope of attracting wild animals and birds. A welcome move to restore the forests of the central Indian tiger landscape. Uh, 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 uh,